I'm grateful for the opportunity to stand before you all one more time with the Word of God. Um, I thank God that His presence is here this morning and uh, dealing with our hearts and speaking to us, each one of us individually, um, uh, in the way that he wants to deal with us. What he says to me is not what he's going to uh, uh, say to you. What uh, he convicts me of is not going to be what he convicts you of. Or same way about encouragement, uh, what he uplifts me about is not what he uplifts you about. But we can all receive at the same time from the same word. Just like, I wasn't planning to say on any of this, but just like Jesus took five pieces of bread and broke it to 5,000 people, the same word that is preached from here by me or pastor or the worship leaders, if you sit in rows just like the people did and wait to receive, you will get a piece of bread this morning. Amen? God will give you the nourishment that you want this morning because he is a God. He is the living bread. Amen. Amen. He never uh, sent anybody away empty-handed. He never uh, rejected anybody who needed a touch from him. In fact, as we know, many people wanted a touch from him and just simply reached out and touched his, touched his garment. And that act of faith uh, came back to them as the answer to prayer that he, uh, they needed. So uh, with that encouragement, um, let us keep moving forward into the message. Amen. Uh, I'm going to continue in this subsection, which is about the uh, entry of Jesus into the public ministry. And uh, Justin started that last week, and he spoke about how Jesus called his disciples. And um, he um, had a and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but he had a heart for them is what um, the main point that you could take away from last week is the, the, you know, he spent all night praying before he officially announced them uh, as the disciples, like the big reveal. Like there were a lot of people following him, but he called out 12 with specific purpose and reveal them to be his 12 disciples. So I want to keep going forward in that same topic and uh, dive a little bit deeper into that. So Jesus, um, I don't know if you can see all that. Um, so let, uh, let's turn to, uh, actually, so let's turn to Matthew chapter 10. It's the same verses we read last week. Uh, the first four verses. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits <clears throat> to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the 12 disciples are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labius, whose name, surname was Tadius, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Um, and I've listed there, I don't know if you can see all of that very clearly, but the listed there, um, the, all the 12 apostles that Jesus had called while he was on earth. And I've grouped them into categories because at each point of time, they had, all of them had an encounter with God, with Jesus, right? There was an initial encounter that where Jesus most often just said, come, follow me. Right or actually, in a, for, for a few of them, they sought him out after in John chapter one, I believe. Uh, you can see that John the Baptist uh, proclaimed Jesus as the Son of God. Right, behold, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And uh, two of John the Baptist's disciples, which we believe to be 
Andrew and John, the apostle, uh, went and followed Jesus from that point on, right? And Jesus, uh, they asked him who he was, and he said what? Come and, come and see, right? And they followed him, and so there's a group of four at that point that had a kind of an encounter with Jesus and knew, came to know that Jesus, you know, exists, that there is something different about him, right? And John is now proclaiming, the previous master is now proclaiming him to be the coming Messiah, right? So, and then, you know, he went on to call Philip and Nathaniel. The reason I grouped them this way is, one, we know Peter, James, and John were kind of the inner circle, right? Jesus spent the most time with them and revealed the most things to them. And then you go a little bit further, you, you know, you have Matthew, Andrew, Philip, and uh, Bartholomew or Nathaniel, we don't, we know a little bit more about what is revealed about how they came to Jesus. Their encounter with Jesus is revealed a little bit more in each of these, uh, each of the four Gospels. And you go further out, um, like number eight through 11, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, and uh, Judas, who's the brother of James, or Thaddeus, those four, we know they were disciples, and they're mentioned in this passage, passage we just read, uh, but we know very little about how they came to follow Jesus, and it's not mentioned. And Thomas, we know a little bit more about him, what he did after Jesus was ascended, right? We know he went to India, but the rest of them, uh, we know about them only from books that were written or church traditions uh, our church history that we can read about, right? And then lastly, we know about um, um, Judas Iscariot, and if we have the time to talk about him, we will, but we know he was also initially called and revealed to be one of the disciples, and he betrayed Jesus, and he was replaced by Matthias. And in fact, I believe that is the only instance that Acts chapter 1 is the only instance that Matthias is mentioned, and I don't know much about what happened to him after either. Then there's a question of Paul. He calls himself the apostle, and he in fact said, I was a one born out of time, right? We know he was born then, but he felt like he missed the action. He was left out, and he learned about Jesus directly later, but we do know he was one of the apostles as well. So just a little bit of an overview uh, just for your understanding, what we see there and what I wanted to focus on today is the path from call encounter to calling to following and kind of what happens after that, right? This path that we ourselves follow Christ in. What you also see is the kind of just the wisdom of God in the structure he has laid out here, right? If you look at any company in this world, any corporation, you go to their website and you can click on like usually about us and you can see an organizational structure, right? Who the leadership is, kind of who the board is, who the management team is and so on, right? And so we just see the wisdom of God in kind of being the best, even kind of the manager, right? So, you know, he didn't do anything just randomly. He didn't do anything in an unorganized manner, right? Same way we see the structure of God in how he started the kingdom of God and the earth too. So he, we had the 12 disciples, we had the inner circle, and then we also had, you know, we talked about the 70 disciples who were sent out, right? After the 12 disciples were sent out, in the same way, and they could be the next layer in the organizational structure. So my point with that is that each one of us have a role and a purpose that God wants to fulfill through us, right? Whether that remains unfinished or fulfilled is up to us. Each of these apostles could have said no each of these apostles could have rejected the call of Christ to say, come, follow me. 
and we'll talk about Peter in a little bit, each, he could have betrayed him and in that bitterness, or denied him and in that bitterness, fell away, right? Or be, gone back to becoming a fisherman. But every step of the way, he decided to stay with Christ. And he fulfilled the call of Christ. Amen? So God has a plan for our lives, and he has a vision for our lives. But we have a part to play in that too, in responding to his call in our lives. Amen? And many times, our life takes turns and directions that we don't understand. We don't, uh, you know, appreciate sometimes too, or things that don't go our way in the way we think. And we get disappointed or dejected, and we question the call of God on our lives. But one thing we can be certain of is that God loves us more than we, can, we will ever understand. Amen? And if we remain faithful, if we respond, even if we go away from him, like Peter did, if you respond and come back, and you ask God to build you up again and again, he will, like uh, Paul said, I believe in Philippians, that he who began a good work in you is able to finish it even unto the end. Amen? It doesn't matter what age you're in. There might be parts of your life that is unfinished. There might be character flaws in your life that is unfinished. God is wanting to rebuild those things today, in this moment. And so he's asking you to respond to that call. He wants you to do a great work in his kingdom through you. Amen? And we don't know what that looks like, but he's asking you to respond to that call. And Isaiah said, Lord, here I am. Send me. And he is faithful to show you the way. Amen? Amen. Okay, so going a little bit deeper into that, I'm going to read, uh, so I'm going to just talk about like the first three a little bit, mo mostly Peter, and kind of their encounter and path to becoming kind of the leaders of the church. So let's read Matthew chapter 4. Verses 18 to 22. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers, fishermen. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they strayed away, left their nets, and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two other brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately, <clears throat> excuse me, left the ship and their father and followed him. So if you just read this portion, you might think that... Uh, Jesus just happened upon these fishermen and he said, follow me, and they followed him. But I will lead you to say that I don't think that's true. That if you read Luke chapter 5, you get the, what you call the backstory, right? Uh, the beginning. And a peek behind the scenes of what happened in those four verses, there are more to it than what Matthew talked about, right? There was more to what happened there, there than simply that short conversation. It doesn't mean that Matthew, uh, you know, was lying or hiding it. It's, it's like uh, how I say a story and how Christina says a story. Now, she'll get to the punchline very quickly, and I might take half an hour for the same incident, okay? It's just who we are. She gets mad at me all the time. You talk too much. Uh, but just, it's different personalities, right? And God chose Luke to fill in some of the details that Matthew didn't, right? For whatever reason. And so we see that Luke shed the light on what happened there. 
And it's so important to study the Gospels together because all of our stories, you know, I see all of you sitting in the pews um, every, every week. We come here and, uh, you know, I sh shake uh, as many people's hands as I can. And, uh, you know, how are you doing? And we say, uh, we're doing good. But what I don't know is what you went through the last week or what you've been going through the last few months, right? Maybe a few people know. Uh, the, uh, the joy you experienced or the bitter disappointment and failure that you experienced or where you were rejected and you felt like you were an outsider last week. I don't know all of that when I just simply shake your hands, right? But God has got all of that in his book. Amen? The reason we need to understand this together is because our stories are not just one lines, right? It's complicated. It's messy many times. But God is in the middle of that. And that is part of how he is calling you. Yes, we make mistakes, but he uses those mistakes to build you up again. But each step of the way, he's asking you, come follow me. Stay with me. And that is so important to understand. So Peter himself, the reason I'm saying that is because you might think, wow, Peter's such a spiritual guy. Jesus said, follow me, and I follow me. I don't, I don't feel that way. I don't kind of feel it. Like, I don't feel the emotion, right? But we know that there's more to the story. So if you look at Luke chapter 5, I don't have the time to read it. I'll just kind of explain. It's a very famous story. So, you know, they were... <clears throat> And what I believe is studying this together is they had already encountered Jesus, okay? Earlier when John the Baptist proclaimed Jesus, they knew who Jesus was. This is a second or third meeting, right? So they were fishing, and we know the story that there were two boats, and Jesus was starting his ministry, he was preaching, right? All these people were following him because he had started doing all these miracles and his teaching was just powerful and something that they had never heard before. And so um, it was, they were just crowding him on the coast, on the beach, and he saw two boats and he uh, asked if he could enter the boat. So what I believe is that Jesus knew exactly what he was doing, Right? He knew that was Peter's boat. He knew that he had just spent all night fishing and didn't catch anything. He knew that he had been disappointed that because this is what they do. This is who they are. They are fishermen, right? If they don't catch fish, they don't feed their family. But more than that, it is also how they identify themselves as fishermen, right? Many of us are engineers or nurses or doctors, accountants. That's who we identify as in this world. You know, that's how people know us. Oh, this is so-and-so, right? And so failing in that core part of them was truly, what, just uh, defeating or crumbling, right? So many times in the, it's in the midst of our utter failure, or in the midst of just total loss, Jesus asks just quietly, can I enter your boat real quick? Can I just come into your ship? He could have said, you know what, I'm just, I don't have time for this right now, okay? Jesus, leave me alone. He said, no, 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 just come in. Please come in. So many times our encounters with Jesus is not this big frenzy. It is in quiet moments. And so Peter came into the boat. And, uh, you know, Jesus didn't, like, address the situation, right? He just ignored it. We feel the same way, too. Like, Jesus, don't you know what I'm going through? Are you just standing and preaching? You don't know that I just didn't catch anything? I'm not going to eat? And you know, we also think that people don't care about us, right? Pastor is preaching as if nothing happened. Don't you know what he's going through? Don't, doesn't he know what I'm, what I'm dealing with here? We ask these questions many times, right? So Jesus preached, and then later, 
uh, verse 4 in chapter 5 says, when he had left speaking, when he finished the purpose of speaking. Another thing we also have to understand, I'm sorry I'm going very slow today. Uh, <laughs> another thing we have to understand is that it's not just about us. No matter how horrible a situation you're going through, the person next to you might be going through an even worse situation. Amen? So Jesus took the time to preach to those people and waited, because he knew Peter wasn't going anywhere. He was in his boat. He can't just drive off, right? He waited to finish what he had to do before he dealt with Peter. It doesn't mean that he didn't love Peter. It doesn't mean that he didn't care about Peter. But he wanted Peter to wait. Sometimes he just wants you to wait. Yeah, it's horrible, but we just need to wait. He'll get to you, right? And that's how we know, have empathy for other people, what they're going through, right? So anyway, so, sorry, I, I gotta go faster. So then Jesus turned his attention to Peter after he finished his ministry, and he said, he didn't say anything. He didn't dwell in his misery. He didn't say, oh, Mone, tell me about your, he just said, go and launch into the deep. Go back and try again. And what did Peter say? Master, we toiled all the night and I've taken nothing. But at your word, I will let down the net. At your word. It is okay to complain to God. It is okay to say, God, I tried my best. I did what I could. I preached to my relatives. They don't want to hear anything. I tried to talk sense into my kids. They don't want to hear anything. I tried to talk sense into my parents. They don't want to listen to me. I toiled all night. But at your word, because Jesus, you invited him into the boat. You asked him into your life. You sought him out. Or he sought you out and you responded. And he told you what to do. At that moment, don't harden your heart. At that moment, it's okay to complain, say, listen, I fail. But at your word, I am going to do this one more time. Amen? Amen? Amen. One more time, I'm going to do this. And so he did. So, and we know the story. There's one detail I want to point out that I want you to remember. Is they caught so much fish that they could not carry it. They had to get help from the other boat. And by the way, uh, big clue, I believe that was James and John's boat, okay? So they came and helped him, and they, they couldn't pull it. The boat was sinking, like the overflowing, you know, I could stop right there, make a big prosperity preacher preaching out of it and say, wow, God will give you pressed down, shaking together, overflowing. You can't even room enough to contain, right? But that's not the message, right? The God gave them more than what they expected, right? More than what they could have caught on the, even if toiling all night. And the, the detail there is the net was, it was overflowing, the net was breaking. But there was no count of how many fish they caught. Okay? So hold on to that. So they brought back, and then immediately, verse 8, this is the kicker. Simon Peter saw it. He fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. For he was astonished. And all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And he said, oops, I forgot to flip the slides. And he said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ship to land, they forsook all and followed him. This is where the prosperity preachers get it wrong. We, this is where we go wrong. That when we see the miracle, do we respond to it by chasing more miracles 
to get that same abundance again and again? Or do we respond like Peter? He's, he realized there is no way an ordinary person could have made this happen. He realized who Jesus was at that moment. And the only response he could have was saying, I am a sinner. That's it. He didn't say, thank you for this fish. See you later. He said, I am a sinner. That's it. When we understand who Jesus is, when we have that revelation of Christ in the miracles that we experience, this is what our response should be. Lord, wow, I don't deserve this. I was in this middle of this failure and you honored me. Even nobody cared, you responded to me. Wow, I thought I was a gone case, a hopeless case. But you came into my boat. And each one of you can say that. Each one of you can say, Jesus came into your boat at some point in your life. The question is, are you responding the way Peter did? Amen? This is what I believe James and John saw what happened to Peter. And they also said, wow, I am following this Jesus. This is the detail that Matthew left out. But Luke finished. And I am going to follow this Jesus because only God can do this. Amen? And then Jesus gave them the call, I will make you fishers of men. And the last verse says they forsook all and followed him. I just want to say one thing quick and I'm going to go to the last slide. Is there is, and we, hopefully we'll spend more time on this at some point. This is the slight kind of this gap where we decide what kind of Christian we're going to be. Yes, God still gives us miracles. God still performs great things in our life. But the question is, how do we respond to those? Amen? Do we want to more, more of those, that, like the Israelites who wanted quail and it was coming out of their nose, or do we want to follow the God who gave them the miracle? Amen? This is what I believe causes us to chase after people who are peddling miracles and deliverance. False teachers have crept into our church and, and displaying all kinds of weird manifestations of so-called manifestations of the Spirit. And we chase it because that's what we want. Right? And it's coming out of our nose. But God is saying, forget about the miracles. Follow me. Amen? Yes, what you need, I'll kill. still keep doing miracles. But follow me. Amen? Okay, last point. So, man, I'm already out of time. Okay, so um, I'm going to invite the worship team up. John chapter 21. I mean, I could spend another 20 minutes on this one, but I'm going to fast forward. So now Jesus had died on the cross, he uh, resurrected, and he had already appeared to the disciples twice. This is the third time. And before he did that, right, all the disciples were hanging out, and it doesn't say why they did this, but Peter said, I'm going fishing. He went back to what he had left, right? And they all went, and the same experience happened. They didn't catch anything. And now Jesus was standing on the shore and asking, hey, you have any meat? And they said, no. And then he said the same thing. Um, I mean, it's just interesting how we're so dumb sometimes, right? Like, even at to this point, they didn't realize it was Jesus. Like, sometimes God is speaking to us. We don't know he's telling us something, right? And so anyway, so they put the net down. Even then, they didn't realize this is Jesus. And they caught fish that they couldn't all night. And they, they, you know, they brought it into the boats, right? And then they realized this is Jesus. Okay, so I don't want to go into all the detail. But this is a, one point I wanted to mention. This time, this time, 
there was a count of how many fish they caught. It was 153. The net was not breaking. So when we are adamant and stubborn and only want miracles and deliverance and all these things, that yes, God is faithful to give, but that's what our focus is. Yes, God answers our prayer, but many times it's just to show you he's still God, right? Yeah, sure, I'll give you your answer. Understand, I'm just, you know, responding to what you're saying, but that's not what I want for you. Does that make sense? Because the fish they needed, he already had ready for them on the shore. They didn't need to catch it. Jesus had the fish for them. It was already baked and ready to go. So we have everything we need with Christ. But the last point I want to make was the conversation that Jesus had with Peter. We know the story where he asked him three times, do you love me more than this, these? And Peter got upset that Jesus was asking him this question. He was like an affront. What do you mean, do I love you? You know that I love you, right? But we know that Jesus asked him, do you agape me? And he responded, um, I fillet you. It's like telling somebody I love you and they respond with, I like you. I love you and then somebody says back, yeah, I like you too, right? That's how Peter responded. So the point I'm making with this portion of the story is, you know, yes, we all followed Jesus. We all had an encounter. We all realized he was God and decided to be a fisher of men or serve him in wherever. But now years have gone by and we've gone back to fishing. And Jesus is appearing to you again and asking, do you still love me? Do you love me? And is that why you're following me? Or you just want fish, right? You just want fish or do you love me? And he's asking, it's an open-ended question. If you do love me, feed my sheep. Amen. If you do love me, then feed my sheep. Feed my people. Break the word that he gave those 5,000. Distribute the word to his people. Appear to the brokenhearted. Set the captives free. Feed my sheep. May his name be glorified.